All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. I guess I must be busy of teaching because I see But thanks everybody for joining us today for the round round. Uh, today we'll be doing journal clubs. So our topic of interest today will be the use of PPIs. And so there were two recent articles from December um, using PPIs in different uh, settings. And so I want to have a look at one of those articles. Hopefully you had a chance to take a look at them before coming to our meeting today. If not, there are some articles tweeted about if you want to follow along. And one of them we started talking about the first, the first case. <clears throat> okay, so the first um, study we're going to talk about is pantoprazole in patients at risk for GI bleeding and not ICU. Um, does anyone know why we care about using pantoprazole? Like, what are the adverse effects in our critically ill patients? C. diff. What? Yeah. Um, and more at risk for MI, too. More risk for MI? Yeah, that's what it said, right? I don't know what study that came from, but. Um, so the clinical question is, in adults admitted to an ICU with an increased risk for GI bleed, does administration of pantoprazole alter mortality at 90 days compared to placebo? Um, so the prevalence of GI bleed is, is estimated anywhere from 1.5 to 8.5% in ICU patients. Um, what do people think of that prevalence? Pretty high. Pretty high. Um, so most of the people we start GI prophylaxis on is for patients with any critically ill patients. So if they're mechanically ventilated, if they have coagulopathy, hepatic kidney failure, if they're on an anticoagulant, um, and if they're not eating. And then we already talked about the harm of PPI use. Okay, so this um, article was called the SUP ICU trial. It was in 33 uh, European ICUs just quite a lot. Um, perspective, stratified, randomized control trial. The inclusion criteria um, were adults, and then you had to have one or more risk factors for GI bleed, we kind of already talked about. And um, it had to be an acute admission to the ICU, so no um, elective procedures. The people they excluded were if you had any contraindication to a PPI, um, if you were already receiving PPI therapy before, which I would imagine would knock out a bunch of people. Um, diagnosis of peptic ulcer disease, if you were pregnant, had an organ transplant, or if you were withdrawing care. Okay. So, um, people were randomized to basically placebo of no prophylaxis or uh, PPI of 40 milligrams daily. Um, until 90 days or ICU discharge. Readmissions received the same treatment, and then all other care was as per the clinician. So the primary outcome they looked at was mortality at 90 days. And then the secondary outcomes were composited GI bleed, C. diff, um, pneumonia, MI, and percent of days without life support. What do people think of the composite of the secondary outcomes? It's interesting because we have both things that are negative effects of PPI, so the C diff, TAP, and MI, but then we also have things that are negative effects if you don't use the PPI, which is the GI bleed. So it's kind of odd to combine all of those. Um, but we can talk about that later. Okay. So about 3,200 people were randomized. The median ICU stay was six days. Um, interestingly, 60% had enteral feeding on the first day, which we'll talk about more in the discussion, but there's been a lot of other separate studies saying if someone is on enteral feeding, you don't have to use PPI prophylaxis. So it kind of also skews the data in that way. Um, and then 
17% uh, the placebo and 19% the PPI group discontinued the trial regimen. So they were pretty similar at baseline. Um, some interesting things that you might want to look at um, for PPI use in general. So we have the chronic lung disease, also the use of steroids, as we know that can increase risk of DIV. Um, and quite a lot had quite a lot of And also a lot were undergoing emergency surgery. So pretty, pretty sick people. Okay. So mortality at 90 days was no different in the PPI group versus the placebo group. And um, the secondary outcomes were also no different for the composite. But when we look at GI bleeding, there was a statistically significant decrease in the PPI group. What do people think about the prevalence of GI bleeding in this study? So before it was estimated across all, a number of other studies is like 1.5 to 9 percent. And then this is just a breakdown of the secondary outcomes. We'll look at it again. The only um, significant difference was when when they were broken down individually was the GI bleeding. Interestingly, there was no difference in the rates of the adverse outcomes from PPIs. So there was no difference in the rate of C diff, in the rate of pneumonia, and the rate of MI. Even though we think that those are the adverse outcomes. Of And then when you look at, um, at the relative risk of the primary outcome, when you look at different groups, interestingly, um, they were all, all pretty much non-significant, but this had a, a trend for more severe patients doing better with the placebo. I'm not really sure how to interpret that. Kind of interesting. Okay. So overall, 90-day um, mortality um, and the secondary, the composite of the secondary outcomes, there was no difference. We saw fewer significant GI bleeds in the PPI group, but there was no increase in infection or MI. So, what do you guys think are the of, of, are the strengths of the study? Size. Yeah, it was a really large study, right, in multi center. Patients were really. Mm-hmm. What about limitations, you guys think? I thought, was there a diverse population in terms of ethnicity, or was it mostly Caucasian? They're based in Europe, right? Um. Wait, what is it? Yeah. Oh, there you go. They didn't have ethnicity on here. Yeah. But I can imagine it was probably not a Um, the other thing with the GI bleeding is that we didn't know that all of these GI bleeds were from stress ulcers, um, which is what we worry about in the ICU if we don't give someone close to access. Um, so we don't know what the GI bleed was from. And then we kind of already talked about it was kind of a strange composite secondary outcome that had, the, had both positive and negative effects of the treatment. Um, and then it, it may be underpowered because the anticipated event rate of the GI bleed was um, higher than what they actually And then there's this, you know, there's this question about the enteral feeding, because 60% had enteral feeding on day one, and then 80% ended up having enteral feeding um, by day four. So 
there was there's been several studies, including this one, that have already looked at central nutrition um, as stress also prophylaxis. And I don't know what they do here, but at least when I was in training, we didn't give PPI prophylaxis to people who were not. So what do people think? Does this change their management at all? There was an editorial um, in New England that was also written and said like, well, the rate of GI bleeds is so low in the ICU population that um, you know, we shouldn't use PPIs at all. But I would kind of argue that that was a high rate of GI bleeds. You know, in previous studies, up to eight percent. Do we know what the sequelae of the GI bleeds? Let's say GI bleeds was decreased from four percent to two percent. Mm -hmm. Were those people who didn't need a transfusion? They didn't need a procedure. You know, it's, uh, well, it might have been less transfusions, I guess. Well, I have comments about that. Um, they didn't need a doctor because not everyone is required to have this doctor. You have to look back. Yeah. But anyway, I guess the point is like maybe the PPI lowers rates of GI bleeding, and then they also didn't see any adverse effects from the PPIs. Mm -hmm. which is... Okay, well, we'll see what you guys think after talking about the next article. Mm -hmm. um, So that was population with PPI use in kind of a critically ill stressed population prophylaxis. So we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about um, use of PPIs in patients who are already on anticoagulation. Um, so this article just came out uh, last month in December in JAMA, <laughs> um, looking at the use of PPIs in patients on um, DOAX in particular. So um, theirs was more not necessarily a causal study, but they were looking at whether or not um, anticoagulant use and PPI therapy were associated with risk of upper GI bleed. So as far as some background for this uh, and why they wanted to do the study, was that um, looking at the DOEX that we've been using now over the last 10 years, um, there has been some association, some association with some of these DOEX with increased rates of GI bleed versus warfarin, which is the standard of care prior to the introduction of things like Xeralto, Eloquiz, Fredaxa, et cetera. While in general, major bleeding has been found to be lower in patients on DOEX compared to warfarin, uh, when you break down the causes of the causes of bleeds, um, some of these agents in particular, dabagatran, which we don't quite use as much now, and Zeralto, which we do see quite frequently, um, have increased risk of GI bleed in particular. Um, while there's been no direct studies comparing the different agents as far as the DOEX, um, some studies that have been done in the last five, ten years have suggested that there are varying rates depending on which DOEF you actually use. Um, but again, there's been no direct comparisons as of yet. And some other studies have suggested that PPI co-therapy, so meaning that patients who are also on PPI um, at the same time, have been associated with a decreased risk of GI bleed. So um, this was a retrospective cohort study um, using a database of Medicare beneficiaries. So it was a pretty, pretty big database that they pulled from. Uh, the population they looked at, um, so they included page, patients who were age greater than 30. Um, they had to be on some sort of DOAC or warfarin. Um, they, did not, they did not include patients on adoxaban for this study because that was a newer agent. And so there were enough patients to, to pull for that. Um, as far as, since it did come from the database, they wanted to make sure that the information they could pull from these patients was complete as possible. So they needed fairly wide demographic data. Um, looking at the database uh, history, they needed to have at least one outpatient visit and one prescription fill in the year um, of enrollments. And they looked at a pretty long time period. It was um, about four years. As far as patients that were excluded from um, the cohorts, so this included patients who were on ESR who were ESRD, um, who had some sort of other GI uh, illness. And then if the patient had already had a, had a hospitalization for uh, bleeding before um, the cohort enrollment. So as far as, uh, as, as follow-up, patients were followed until the end of the study period. Um, 
or up to a year after they um, not if they did not fill the uh, prescription. If they filled their prescription for a different uh, anticoagulant at some point during the study period, meaning that they changed um, anticoagulants used for whatever reason. Um, if they lost the uh, were lost from the database, and if they failed to meet any of the criteria as we previously mentioned, and then if they had any sort of bleeding related hospitalization, that was also an endpoint for this study. And then death. So as far as uh, PPI exposure, so they sort of grouped these people into three categories. So the first category was um, patients who had um, a PPI filled while they were on anticoagulation. Uh, patients who had a prescription filled in the last year, but their supply had ended at some point. And the patients who did not have any sort of PPI whatsoever during the study period. Um, as far as our other demographic data, they also looked at they also looked at other things that would increase risk of bleeding. So they followed patients who had prescriptions filled for NSAIDs, um, antipilot agents such as aspirin or Plavix, et cetera, um, during their enrollment. So as far as the primary endpoints, so they looked at bleeding that could have possibly have been prevented by PPI therapy, meaning patients who were diagnosed with esophagitis, peptic ulcer disease, or gastritis. And so as far as results, um, they had quite a, quite a number of results. So they looked at almost uh, 640,000 patients and had a many percent years in follow-up because of this large study. Um, looking at some of the risk factors for patients who were on PPI therapy, um, as you can imagine, these patients um, had risk factors such as recent initiation of anticoagulation. Um, they had a history of upper GI tract. And then they were also medications that would increase the risk of bleeding, such as aspirin or Plavix. <coughs> so looking at results for patients who were not on any sort of PPI, so they found that their incidence hospitalization was about 1 in 15 per 10,000 uh, person years. And interestingly, well, not interesting, but in, um, in agreement with previous studies looking at um, different DOACs and GI bleeds, they did find that Patients on Xeralto had a significantly higher rate of GI bleed versus patients who were on Eliquis, uh, Perexa, and Morphine. So you can sort of see the difference in incidence um, on person years uh, there. So 144 person years uh, in Xeralto versus much lower in the other anticoagulant groups. Also, some things that they noticed was that the um, for Eliquis, um, which again, in previous studies looking at Eliquis, uh, was found to have pretty low rates of bleeding. Um, this was in agreement also, and they did find that Eliquis had significantly lower bleeding rates than for even Pradaxa and Warfarin. Uh, for those patients who were on PPI, um, patients who were on PPIs had a lower incidence rate than patients who were who were not on PPIs. So again, recall that um, the incidence rate was 115 for patients who were not on PPIs, and the incidence was noted at 76. Uh, for patients who uh, were on a PPI with a relative risk of 0 0.66. So again, this would indicate that there is a trend towards lower GI bleed rates <coughs> for patients um, who were on a PPI. Uh, the lower incidence was most pronounced with um, Pradaxa, and then the least was Xeralto. So this chart kind of demonstrates what they found in a little bit more of a better visual schematic. And so this is, oh, let's see. so looking at this chart, so this looks at the incidence of upper GI bleed. And the orange bubbles are for patients who were not on any PPI and those who were on PPI. So as you can see, Eliquis in general has a much lower incidence rate as compared to the highest, which is Xeralto. And then here's kind of the standard warfarin. And then Pradexa has a large kind of margin, which we'll talk about a little bit later for patients who were on a PPI versus not on a PPI. Does anybody have any thoughts about these results, just looking at this schematic? And does it kind of fit with our what you see in clinical practice? Um, I don't believe they excluded patients with CKD, so just ESRD. It's a question of how consistent it is. In fact, that it's you know sort of it's consistent benefit across more sort of 
two more confidence that it's a good benefit there. Okay, right? Right, so every single group, you know, they're, if you are in PPI, you have a lower incidence of um, GI bleed as compared to no PPI. Okay. So, so one thing I always do when I get, see complicated results is I try to figure out what the absolute benefit is. Because here it's like per 10,000. So I have no idea what this means for single patient, none. And so you, there's, there's studies where you, you, know, you decrease the event rate from 7% to 3%. That's a 4% difference. That's pretty darn good. And it's also kind of easy to understand, right? But then you get a lot of these studies where, like, the hazard ratio is, you know, 0.81, and the event rate is 0.3% you know, or point. And you have no clue what that really means in terms of an absolute number. So I, I always try to mentally convert it into, like, an absolute number. Because yeah. otherwise, you make it something that's statistically significant, and you have no idea what the net benefit is and whether you should do it or not. Right. So this article, if you guys, if anybody read it in detail, is... <laughs> Very, very stat heavy, uh, as you can imagine, pulling from what was it like, almost 650,000 patients. Um, so as Dr. Dunn mentioned, you know, it is helpful to sort of think about an absolute or relative benefits. And so I think that the, my my main takeaway from this was that, again, the relative risk of patients who were on PPI was much lower um, compared to patients who were on a PPI. Um, so the study go back one slide. So that's sort of my point. So it's statistically significant. There's about a one third less, so 0.66 is 0.34 percent lower, right? So you, you go and go one forward. Uh, yeah. So is it relative risk of 0.66 means reduced by 0.34? So it's reduced by a third, and it's statistically significant. All really important, right? But for me, one when you decide well, how to implement this in practice, it's well, what's the absolute factor? How many? What's the NNP? And that you can't get that. So, so you have to dive into. Um, okay, so um, in this study, they also looked at hospitalization based on patients' risk factors for GI bleed. And so they called a number of different demographic features. I think it was like more than 80. And they derived this really complicated, um, this really complicated uh, risk factor score, which has not been externally validated. Um, it's in the supplement if anybody cares to look at it, but it was way over my head. <laughs> Anyway, the point is that they, they sort of looked at different risk factors and they, they figured out sort of stratifying these patients based on their risk factors and their risk for GI bleed. And um, we'll look at the we'll look at the charts in, in the slide after this to better visualize this. But what they found was that there even in these GI patients with high risk for GI bleeds, um, there was also still that protective effect seen um, of using a PPA, except in those patients who had like no risk factors for GI bleed. Meaning that if you had any sort of risk factor for GI bleed, which we'll talk about a little bit later, then being it on PPI lowered your incidence of having a upper GI bleed. So as far as some of these risk factors they looked at are things that you would imagine would put patients at risk for uh, bleeding, so age, uh, being enrolled in Medicaid, being a nursing home resident, um, having any other sort of any other sort of GI bleed, um, using other medications that would increase your risk of bleeding, um, being elderly and having had some sort of GI issue in the last year. So again, things that would make sense clinically as far as increasing your risk for GI. Um, so this is just saying, so what they found was that the greatest absolute difference um, in these high-risk patients was seen, with, so basically Xeralto um, was kind of the highest risk, and as we mentioned before, Eliquis was the lowest risk, regardless of whether or not they were on a PPI. So again, some And notably, they also noted that um, whether or not you were taking it, if you were using Pradaxa, um, there was a much uh, more decreased risk of uh, hospitalization if you were not than if you were not on a PPI, which we'll talk about a little bit later as far as the pathophysiology for that. So a little bit more visually um, easier to digest here. So internally derived um, risk score. So patients in the lowest risk category um, really had about the same incidence of um, GI bleeding. They were low risk, and PPIs didn't really make so much of a difference. Um, again, Pradaxa was a little bit of a difference, which we'll talk about a little bit later. For patients at medium risk, you can start to see that there is an effect of being on a PPI towards lower risk of GI bleeding. And then for those at the highest risk for GI bleeding, uh, based on some of those factors we talked about already, um, you can see that being on a PPI really reduced your risk of having a GI bleed. So again, the difference was most marketed in patients who were on dabigatran, 
Um, and in general, Xeralto uh, was sort of the highest risk for GI bleeding. Uh, Warfarin is kind of the standard here. And then Eliquis in general, again, the lowest risk of bleeding. So did that kind of make sense, what I was describing? Are any comments or questions or about this about these findings? <laughs> right, yeah, they, they of course they didn't really convert it into like nice kind of numbers to sort of think about clinically. So yeah, it, it would take some sort of Well, all right, so let's, let's take a crack at this. So for Dabigatran, there's 300 per 10,000 person years. So this person here. Well, I do it for 100 person years, which is sort of similar to what you're saying. So if that's 30 per 1,000 or 3 per 100. Can you just do that? But you, it's not particularly valid, but it, it's numerically so similar. So it's roughly 3%, and that's, let's say it's 150, which would be 1.5 per 100. So 3% to 1.5%. Now we do that right? 300 over 100,000? So 3% to 1.5%. So that's a 1.5% absolute difference. That means for every 100, you improve 1.5. That means uh, the number needed to treat is like 7 it's 1.5 percent difference, so you can do it. You know, if you really want to spend a little bit of time. To me, I, I can't apply results to patients without doing it. You know, otherwise, someone tells me it's just insignificant. But you know what? So, NNT is about probably about 70 ish for the biggest at, at the high, and that was at the high risk, right? Yeah. We know that's the biggest bang for the buck. So it'll be a higher energy for everybody else. But based on this, I feel like it's probably just right now. Which. Which we are kind of doing, which we are sort of trending towards. I mean, I think in general we are using Eloquist more these days. I don't know if anybody's in clinical practice what people are seeing most often now. I'm there are already lots of Eloquist that come to us on Right, we don't change it. I feel like most people are still coming towards Eloquist, but I think we are starting more patients on Eloquist. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah
um, to create that acidic environment. And so that acid that is released from the Pradaxa is thought to actually increase the risk of you know, GI-related issues. So the thought is that either the PPI protects from the acid from the Pradaxa itself, or conversely, because the it may actually affect the um, the anticoagulant effect of Pradaxa because you're basically you know creating a less acidic environment in your stomach when you're on a PPI. So there's those are two hypotheses for that. Um, I'm not this study they didn't look to see you know sort of the efficacy of the anticoagulation, but that would be sort of interesting to look at in a future study. Um, and again, as we sort of talked about already, um, for the highest risk patients, so that in that in that last chart, um, Zeralto without a PPI gave you your highest risk of jet bleeding, and beyond a pixaban with a PPI uh, was your lowest risk. So again, this chart right here. So some of the limitations, so again, this is a retrospective study, so no prospective study, no prospective data. Um, the population is limited to Medicare enrollees, so in general, we're older. Um, so they excluded patients who were switched as far as anticoagulation, so we don't really know what happened to patients who were switched for XYZ reason. Um, and patients were on over-the-counter, so again, sometimes you know patients may not have aspirin or other NSAIDs or um, uh, PPIs captured. And then as far as that um, novel bleeding risk score, that was calculated using many, uh, many variables, which may not necessarily be applicable in clinical practice. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked a little about this already, but what, do you, what are people's thoughts in general about this study and how it would apply to our patients that we see? Does this influence what sort of agent you would recommend for patients um, if they are coming in with, uh, for example, a new PE or something like that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think this really opened my eyes as far as like really seeing the difference as far as uh, risk of GI bleeding. And so I probably will try to maybe favor Eloquis more in the future, insurance permitting anyway. Liz? Um, I would say. I mean, I just like people always make sense. Like, okay, we were out there first, also. Oh, and okay. we marketed. So people are just comfortable with it. Yeah, that. I don't want to say it's a factor, but I think there's a lot of comfort in the area. I'm not sure if it's a factor. Always twice a day. Always twice a day. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so I'm I think for me, I. Tended to favor Zeralta because it is once daily dosing. Um, you know, in general, the safety profile is better than warfarin, so you know, we should be using them. But as far as a specific choice for which DOAC to use, I think it really does is sort of uh, provider dependent. And so there are a lot of different things that you think about when you decide that. You know, accessibility, risk factor profile, etc. And so, um, you know, maybe this this is something that would sort of move our scrubbing patterns in different directions. Because I feel like the last few years I have seen a lot. Of Zeralto use, but now in the last maybe one or two years, there has been more Eloquis used. There's a subtle difference here between VTE patients and AFib patients. For VTE patients, both Rivaroxaban, Zeralto, and Apixaban are safer than Warfarin in terms of bleeding. So they've both made choices and they've never been compared head to head in their articles. So for VTE, I think either is a great choice. Maybe based on secondary data, you might lean towards a pixaban, but I think they're both great choices. And then on the AFib side, the divigatran reduces stroke. And so, but and a, a pixaban basically does does the like, it reduces stroke rate a little bit, reduces bleeding, and reduces mortality. So it's sort of the yasi of uh, anticoagulants for AFib. So on the AFib side, it's probably. Um, they didn't do a cost analysis on this. Um, I'd have to look at the supplement. I don't think 
I don't recall if they talk, if they look at HG blocker um, therapy as well as PPI therapy in this in the study when they're looking at the demographics. Certainly in the dis results of discussion, they didn't comment on that. So I would assume probably a non-factor. Then overall, for all patients, whether for ET or HA, you found a safer medication for degrading with or without PPI. Also, I think the safest is more for all patients. Right, and that is popular for we're using it more as far as like TKD. So I think probably the takeaway is just to try to describe it. It's a bad I think it's, I don't think it's for sure. Right, I guess that could sort of depend on just carriers and so forth. Um, one thing I also took away is that, um, you know, when I first started out, you know, Pradaxa was the first agent that we were using, and then there was a lot of anecdotal stories as far as like GI bleeding, pretty serious GI bleeds for that with, with Pradaxa. And so it sort of fell out of favor in like the mid 2010s. Um, but, you know, looking at these sort of, look at these incidence rates, I mean, it doesn't seem as significant as, you know, it was thought to be. Um, at least you can see here as a, you know, just about as equivalent as a and which we're using more often anyway. Um, so, you know, maybe that is something that you know, could be used um, as a potential option. Uh, but it seems to have fallen out of favor in the last, you know, five, ten, five years or so. I also think that if you prescribe more things in that, we can probably prevent patients from being committed to like long PPIs. Because I think we already have so many patients on PPIs that no one remembers who they were. And, you know, they really have serious adverse effects. And all of these papers are coming out. I don't want this to become another push for a give more PPI. Right. One sort of hesitancy to say here that viroxaban and Dirichan have about the same bleeding rate is this is not randomized. So you, if, if docs are more worried about bleeding and they're putting their higher risk patients on viroxaban, you know, they're going to make the viroxaban rate look a little higher. If they put your low, all your low risk patients, on the bigger trend, the lower the, the bigger trend rate. It's an observation trial, really can't compare with this for that group. So it's just good. Okay. Any other thoughts as far as this study trial or bonus? Sorry, take home points or conclusions. <laughs> uh, let's see, what would be our take home points? Uh, I don't know, one more, well, we've talked about yours a little bit already. But... <laughs> 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 And maybe in the yeah. in the critically ill population, like maybe using PPI for people who are not using regulars for yeah. that short period of time. Maybe a short period of time. And we want them to take longer. Yeah, I mean, I think this just emphasizes to us, you know, the importance of a good med rec. And so a lot of times the patients are on an H2 blocker or on a PPI, and we don't really know why. It's kind of like a historical thing that sort of gets pulled in. Uh, but always sort of revaluing why these patients are on these medications. And, do they have a true indication for it still, or is it just something that's left on? I think it's continued. Okay, well, I think that's it for our discussion. Thank you, everybody. I think that was a really nice discussion. If you guys have any articles that um, you're, you've read recently that you think that would be good for presentation, uh, please let me know. We'll be happy to uh, present them for our next session. Thank you. Thank you.